Hi, I'm Darren Peppard. Welcome to the Leaning into Leadership podcast, the podcast dedicated to today's hardworking leader. Join me every Sunday for leadership insight, inspiration, and a little pep talk to keep you rolling down your road to awesome. Welcome in everybody to episode 40 on the Leaning into Leadership podcast. My guest today is one of my absolute favorite people. He has been an incredible friend, an incredible mentor, and somebody who just honestly makes me laugh every time I talk to him. Our guest today is Tom Cody. Tom is the co-founder of Top 20 Training. He shares his unique witticisms, insights, and wisdom gathered from his 40 years in the classroom. Tom, during his professional life, has been committed to education, serving as a grade school and high school math teacher and a social-emotional learning teacher from 1974 until his retirement from teaching in 2014. Tom now devotes his time and energy to Top 20 Training and its mission to revolutionize American education. His one-of-a-kind trainings are engaging, humorous, and thought-provoking. He has co-authored Top 20 Teachers, The Revolution in American Education, Top 20 Parents, Raising Happy, Responsible, and Emotionally Healthy Children, and Top 20 Teens, Discovering the Best Kept Thinking, Learning, and Communicating Secrets of Successful Teenagers. Tom and I have a very unique relationship. Many years ago, I was at a conference, the Jocelyn's Renaissance Conference, and I had just kind of discovered that I wanted to take my life and my career in the direction that I've taken it. And I had listened to Tom speak, and I was just real fortunate to catch him in the hallway and walk with him a little bit and just ask, you know, hey, can I have breakfast with you tomorrow? I'd like to pick your brain. Folks, from that moment on, Tom and I have become really good friends. We now co-speak together with our uh, really fun, really engaging school culture and climate piece called Stay in Your Lane. School culture starts with you. Um, This was a phenomenal conversation. I'm probably on Zoom with Tom at least twice a week. So this is just kind of a peek into my world and the time I get to spend with Tom Cody. We're going to get to that in just a moment. But real quick, here's an announcement from Road to Awesome. All right, Tom, thank you so much for joining me here on the Leaning into Leadership podcast. Um, Definitely looking forward to sharing one of our conversations with my listeners. Uh, Folks, if you don't know, Tom Cody and I actually work together on some projects. So we probably talk, what, Tom, at least once a week, maybe maybe even more. Uh, It seems like we're always on Zoom together. I'm talking to you more than I do my wife, and she lives here. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's probably a fair statement on my end as well. Um, so, Tom, before we dive in, just really quick for my listeners who maybe don't know Tom Cody, um, elevator version, who you are, what you're all about, all those awesome things. Yeah, I'm I'm a 70-year-old man who did 40 years in the mathematics classroom. Uh, two-thirds of my career was spent being a functional, dysfunctional yelling at kids and parents and basketball refs. Uh, the last one third, uh, I happened to run into a mentor, changed my life. Long story short, I'm now the co-owner of a social emotional learning company called Top 20 Training. And the four of us run around the country, meet wonderful people like Darren and find a common cause for revolutionizing American education. And the elevator just hit floor six, so that's all the time you got. Ding. All right. So let's. there's something in there that I want to unpack a little bit. And one of the things I love about this conversation is I know you really well. And I've heard so many of your stories. I haven't heard them all, but I've heard so many of them. And so you talk about, you know, that, that moment in time where you went from being the functional dysfunctional to, to being who you are. Or as I've heard you describe it many times, Tom 1.0 versus Tom 2.0. Can you share a little bit of that story of, of just kind of what happened that helped you get it right? Yeah. And again, I I mean, I got Teacher of the Year awards. I was Minnesota Basketball Hall of Fame coach. I was functioning, but I was dysfunctional. It was all, we were winning games because the kids were scared of me. We were, the kids get high grades in my class, high achievement, because I was so egotistical that I would just like, 
barbecue kids that didn't do well. So obviously we got good results. Um, conferences, 1998, I'm sitting in my little chair, a parent and his wife sit down, a dad and a wife, and they said that their daughter, Catherine, hated my guts. Uh, they offered to like meet with me about this. And normally I would have told them to get lost. Remember the lady who sat down before them asked why their kid got an F and I told her we don't give G's. So that's was my, that's kind of how I rolled people. Uh, principal's listening right now. Yeah, the phone rang in your office the next day, believe it or not. Uh, but anyway, Michael and Mary, I went to coffee and they, they showed me some of the stuff, the social emotional stuff they were doing in business. It blew my head up. I, I thought, this is like wonderful for kids. So we started a class in, you know, mistakes, beliefs, attitude for kids. But then about halfway through that first year, I realized the target on this whole thing was me. It wasn't the kid. The target was if we clean up Tom a little bit mentally, suddenly you're going to have different results. And now my ride has been different for 23 years. I'm prosperous mentally, emotionally, physically. I, I'm just better off as a husband, dad, everything. So life-changing for me. I don't know if that makes sense to the listeners. It was just one of those, oh, my God, ahas, you know. Absolutely. I, I think that's uh, I think that's just really incredible. I love I love that story um, for a number of reasons, because I think so many of us, as we make our way through our careers, we, we can easily get stuck in that. We can easily get pulled down into kind of that vortex of negativity. And and, you know, I mean, we think of. You know, when we think of a coach, you know, unfortunately, I think a lot of coaches, especially early in their career, think that's what they're supposed to be. They're supposed to be, you know, tough and yell at kids and yell at referees and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, I made some of those mistakes uh, myself. Uh, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Eric Lillis, loves to tell the story about me getting a technical foul with less than a minute into a basketball game, not less than a minute left, less than a minute into a basketball game. I actually got teed up. Not going to chase that story. I didn't deserve the technical foul. I still believe to this day. But the point was, you know, there's many of us that that probably go through some of these struggles. And every now and again, we need that tap on the shoulder. or We need that wake up call of, you know, hey, whoa, you you're way out of bounds here. You know, it's it's maybe time to get up, get up on the balcony and take a look at who you are and what it is that, you know, you really are all about. I would, I would make this pitch to administrators listening, curriculum directors, superintendents, anybody listening to this podcast. You may have a couple people like me, 1.0. You may have a couple on your staff and you're like, I don't know, I, I'd get rid of this guy, but nobody's entering the teaching profession. So it, you can't hire and fire all the time. Uh, maybe the person is still worth investing some time in. And, and no hire, no fire, maybe just inspire. And, and, and I think there's still some reclamation projects on your staffs. They didn't go into teaching to be negative. They didn't go into teaching to be burned out. They didn't do that. They they lost it somewhere along the way. And they just lost the idea that it's about kids and their human development. Uh, I was not evil. I just lost it. I got too concerned with my sarcasm and my little world of ego. Uh, I just needed somebody to shake me. And by the way, I was sick and tired of being sick and tired at that point. I. This wasn't something like, oh, how long do I have to do this? I, I was immediately, I, I, I got in quick. Once there, once I realized there was a better way to be, uh, it, 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 I just liked being better. I don't know how else to say it. You know? Well, I think a lot of it too is, you know, I mean, you get up and look in the mirror in the morning and, and I highly doubt that most educators are looking in the mirror thinking, hey, which kid am I going to go screw over today? Or, you know, what's, you know, what's going to be that, as you put it, you know, the line that I'm going to barbecue a kid with, you know, and, you know, feel good about myself because, hey, I'm so funny. But in reality, I'm, I'm hurting kids. I don't think anybody does that on purpose. I think it just, nope. like you said, I mean, over time, you just kind of, I guess, devolve into that because then sometimes then we're surrounded by negative people in education. Nope. And then it becomes an H-A-B-I-T habit. And so you brush your teeth left-handed long enough, you're going to brush your teeth without thinking about it left-handed. Well, that was me with the, with the, all my behaviors that became habits. And again, I didn't intentionally think, when I hit the basketball game, I'm going to embarrass this girl. I didn't go with that intention, but that was my habit. 
So, lo and behold, that's what would happen every Friday night, you know. Uh, and then it was just so, like so, it just was so much better when you like. I used to apologize after every Wednesday. I'd go to my boss and start apologizing for Tuesday. On Thursday, I would do Wednesday. I mean, it was it was this cycle, this rat race I was on, and it just it was very freeing to get off. You know, and then suddenly, well, uh, put it this way: all the kids I taught in that first stage. Uh, actually, I'm going to the Minnesota State Fair tomorrow. If I run into those kids, they're going to like flip me off or cross the street to avoid me. And then the kids I taught in the second part of my career are going to run up and give me a hug, and buy me a Prano pump, you know, which is a corn dog for the rest of you people in this country. <laughs> I'm glad that you explained that because I don't think I would have known what that was. I might have had to load up and go to the yeah, Minnesota State Fair Pronto just to pump. find out. They're called. They're just as bad for you, with whatever you call them. It's a death on a stick with mustard on it. There you go. Yeah. Well, you know, hey, yeah, you, you fix the space between your ears. You know, there's nothing wrong with eating a corn dog every now and again, right? right. Um, yeah. So, so let's let's go a little bit further with this, Tom. So, so school leaders who, and maybe it's them. I mean, you know, it, it's not like school leaders are immune to you know, developing those habits as well. What What are some of the things? So like, I know when you're out on the road and, and you're doing training or one of the other uh, individuals who um, are your co-founders with, with Top 20 Training are doing some of this training, what are some of the elements that you're talking about? What are the, some of the things that you're telling people that I guess kind of pull the wool off of their eyes a little bit and allow them to actually look in the mirror and go, oh my God, he's talking to me. He, he's, yeah. he's he's talking to me. I'm, I'm the guy who's doing that, and I didn't even realize it. I'll give you three quick ones. One, invitations. You're having a zippity doo dot day, and all of a sudden, in schools, whether you're administrator, superintendent, whatever you are, stuff hits the fan. You phone calls, something unexpected comes up, a school board meeting. Those are just invitations for you to lose it and get negative. You don't have to go yes to every invitation. I used to accept every bad call as a basketball game meant I had to go crazy. Then I started to realize they're just invitations. You don't have to go to every birthday party. That's one. Two, keep your day. When we say keep your day to 300 teachers, their jaw drops. Like, what do you mean? Wow, I've been giving my day away to the airport people, to the traffic, whatever. I accept the invitation, then I give my day away. And I mean, I'm 70, I can't be given days away. But when you say that to a 23 year old teacher, it's equally impactful. They realize I've been giving my day away to a slouchy seventh grade boy in class and my day is now gone. Number three, you signed up for this. Like I, I wanna yell at teachers, administrators, maintenance people, like stop telling me how hard, you know, you signed up to be a teacher. You signed up to be a principal. You signed up to deal with tardies. That's what you do. And again, there's a light bulb that goes on when we talk to audiences or to smaller groups. It's this, oh my God, this has internal validation. Like as Tom is talking about these things, it's not something I didn't know. I'm not putting stuff in people when we train. It's just trying to help them realize what they already knew, which I signed up to be a firefighter. Guess what? There's fire and smoke and water. And if you don't like smoke, water, or fire, sell tile. I don't know. Just don't tell me you're a firefighter and then be mad about fire. Well, the kids don't bring the materials. No, Janice. That's why you, we hired you to teach sixth grade. Is that, that's what you sign up for is kids that don't bring the materials to sixth grade. Now, they don't always like hearing that, but it's so, again, internally valid. Nobody ever says, oh, I, I don't understand, Tom. No. So that's just three. We got we got a hundred of these things, but it, yeah. you know, it's great. When you get old, you know a bunch of stuff. Yep. No, so. <laughs> well, and, and I, I, I don't know how much I'll, I'll play into your you're getting old thing, but, uh, um, I have enjoyed, you know, obviously you and I've been working together now for about a year and a half and, and what, I mean, we've been connected longer than that, but, um, you know, uh, I'll just, I'll tell just a little bit of the story and you can, you can add on to it as much as you want. But, um, 
folks, I actually met Tom in, I don't know, 2018, 2019. We can't seem to remember what year it was. I, th- I think it was 2019. But um, we're at the Jocelyn's Renaissance National Conference. That was before it was called the Global Conference. And I had heard Tom speak a handful of times. So, I mean, everything that he's talking about now, I've, I've heard a, you know, a handful of times before I had this conversation with him. And um, since then, I've, I've heard it well more than a handful of times. But I just remember, you know, knowing that I wanted to go into the space that, that I'm now in. So with, with professional development, with being a speaker and being a consultant, um, you were just somebody that I was like, man, I, I've got to have a conversation with this guy. I really want to pick his brain. And I know we sat down and had breakfast together. Um, and, and somehow from that moment forward, um, we've stayed connected. And now, like, like I said, for this last year and a half, you and I have been doing some some really cool work together and traveling around the country and talking about a lot of what you're talking about, throwing some road awesome into it. And and I'll be honest with you, I'm having a great time and learning a whole, yeah. whole lot from you. And and now I don't remember what in the world my question was going to be. I just started rambling. Well, I so think this, this by the way, folks, is what our conversations every yeah, yeah, week yeah. are like when I'm on with Tom. Yeah. Yeah, I can't remember ever what we're going to talk about, but I think it's about – uh, stay in your lane. Pep and I, are, so we talk, and he, he's going to be a speaker. He's going to write a book, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm right, maybe he will. And then a year later, he's doing this, and he's going to, you know, Pep, you getting out of superintendent to go out on the road and like spread this cool message about being on the road to awesome. So then I'm interested in them. I, I, I don't have time for people that are maybe thinking about doing this. I've met 400 of those. So once you're on this road, I'm thinking, okay, now what? Well, he, he and his friend Eric talked me into going to this retreat out in Colorado in the mountains with our friend Steve. Uh, by the way, I'm wearing the shirt, people, Wild Heart Teacher. Look it up. Heck of a deal. Yeah, got, you got to check it out. Check it out. Steve and his wife, Kelly. So we're doing that. We're hiking this mountain and, and doing this retreat together. And we start talking about, let's do something together. And what we hit on was, Right in the middle of the pandemic, it's it's everybody's blaming everybody for everything. So we come up with this stay in your lane uh, I, metaphor of a car trip where you just take care of your own car as principal, teacher, maintenance worker again. Stop talking about everybody else and the outside noise and you decide what's on your radio. You pack for the trip. You're going to decide where you're stopping. You decide how to get around the construction areas, which are school board meetings or whatever. Um, and just did this whole metaphor. So now we're out on the road doing a 90 minute thing together, uh, which has really been fun to add something new to my arsenal. And to, uh, I think it's very topical for this time in education because everybody wants to tell you how everything would be better if somebody else would do something to fix your classroom or your office. And it's not gonna happen. So I don't know, a- a- add to that, Pep. That's what I, my take on Yeah. No, no, I think that's good. And, and I'll just run right from, from where you left off with that. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes, sometimes in education, we get stuck in, you know, a couple of different spaces. One of those is playing the if only game, you know, and, and you guys know exactly what I'm talking about because you hear it from both sides, you know, as, as school and district leaders. Um, I'm sure there's certainly, you know, you've heard boy, if only. Darren was a better principal, then things would be great in my classroom. And and hopefully as a school leader, you haven't said something like, boy, if only my superintendent would do something, or if only, you know, the 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 state of Wyoming or the Colorado Department of Education or the, you know, uh, Minnesota Principals Association or whatever, you know, if only somebody else would do something, then my life would be better. And the reality is, I mean, we, we have to stay focused on the things that we can control and we got to let go of the things that we can't. And playing that if only game is to me, one of the most toxic things that we do. Um, The other is blame, but I'm going to let you talk about blame here in a minute. But, you know, the more we get into this, if only type of thing, we get away from focusing on what it is that we can control. And um, I, I know, Tom, you and I've talked about this a lot, but the number one thing we can control is ourself and, and how we're going to show up every day, what energy we're going to bring and how do we get our head right every day? Because not every day is perfect, right? I mean, you I know I've heard you call it, um, you know, fix it in your seat before you hit the street. But yeah. Yeah, we got to stay focused on what we can control. Yeah, that, there's two things. One is conditions and experience. 
the virus pandemic was a condition that didn't determine your experience. Uh, you could have you could have had experience A or B during this thing. Now you you control the six inch space between your ears. You don't control anything like traffic or the Minnesota Vikings or any of this outside stuff. The weather. So we blame. Blame is get this now. Pay attention. Hey, pull over if you have to. If you're listening to the car. Blame is a transfer of power. When I blame Darren for anything in our relationship and our business stuff, then I transfer the power to Darren. It's like throwing a tennis ball over to him. Now he has power in his life to control my experience. That's what happens when you blame a basketball ref or a parent phone call is you throw them the power and now you're stuck in whatever yuck you're in until they decide to fix your life. I've been married to Judy, Cody, for 42 years. She loves me. She's never once woke up and done that. Today I fixed Tom's life. So I doubt that the maintenance worker is thinking of you today. I doubt that the airline attendant is thinking of fixing your life. And yet we transfer power to them and then sit there with our arms crossed and wait for them to fix us. It's a fool's game. And I did it for 47 years. I mastered blame. America right now is in two pandemics. There's coronavirus or whatever Omicron variant. And then the second one is blame. And it starts right in the U.S. Senate. You want to watch blame? Turn on C-SPAN and you watch it all day. And then we wonder why America acts like this. And our elected leaders can only blame Republicans, blame Democrats, and the vaccination people blame the non-vax. It's just sick to watch. Absolutely. Well, and I mean, it it has permeated its way down into our schools. Um, I mean, just before recording this, you and I were on a call with a school leader uh, in, in a state that's I mean, working to bring us in. And, and the, among the conversations that we were talking about is how, you know, we knew and honestly, when you and I started putting uh, stay in your lane together, we knew that there were going to be a lot of negative Sounds a lot of just noise about education as you know schools started to reopen and come back into classrooms and whether kids had on masks or didn't have on masks all that junk we knew there was going to be noise but the reality is there was probably a whole lot more noise than what was expected and and as a result yep. that has really permeated into into school cultures and in, and in some places. Uh, to the point where now you have like divides in the staff and, and staff are not like trying to pull on the same end of the rope together. I, I worked with a group not too long ago and, and that was one of the biggest things that superintendent had talked to me about, you know, was, hey, when you come in and you work with our staff, the number one thing you need to know about the challenge in our culture is we have this faction and we have this faction and they blame each other for all kinds of things. And it's it's not political blame, but at the same time, it's, you know, I don't know. Let, let's 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 say, oh, you know what? I taught at the junior high and high school level, so I'll use these examples. At the junior high level, we would blame, you know, sixth grade because, boy, our kids, they just didn't come prepared, you know. And at the high school level, I know we got blamed, you know, at the junior high. You know, well, gosh, if the junior high science teachers would just do a better job. So now it's just it's just become this mushroom cloud of, of blame and negativity and division that's happening in our schools. So I say that to, I guess, float this question over the plate to you. What are some steps that school leaders could be doing right now to bring their staff back together to really focus on that school culture and climate? Yeah, uh, well, when you work with me, there's four pieces to that. When we talk about culture, and I'll do them real quick. One, it's help each other succeed. We have to start, George Koros, if you ever hear his work, uh, and administrators, you all know who that is, make the positive so loud you can't hear the negative is his line. And to me, the four ways to do that are one, you hire, you inspire people to help others succeed. No matter what your role is in the school, your job one is to help somebody else succeed that day, whether it's a kid, a parent, a school board member, everybody goes in with that attitude. Number two, we start training our teachers and we hire them this way. Communicate you matter. 
we we know names we listen to each other we know who's the new grandpa we are all about communicating you matter to people uh, there's a variety of ways to do that but that's that is a uh, standard in our building number three we honor the absent we do not badmouth people when they leave the room we do not make fun of parents behind their back we don't talk about the maintenance worker in an administrative meeting about how terrible they are at the job we talk to the maintenance worker about that we don't go blasting people behind their back and the fourth thing is see and own the problem if there's a piece of paper on the floor it's our piece of paper on the floor that we got to pick up a crying girl in the hall is my student whether she's my student or she's somebody else's student she's my student and then Bowman. if we do those four what we call cultural cornerstones we don't have this problem so ours is more proactive from top 20 is we're gonna we're gonna give you four positive things we're not going to talk about eliminating blame blame goes away when you have this attitude of making the positive loud now does everybody do this no it's a pro it's a journey you know we don't come in and cure everybody with holy water but i'll tell you once people start hearing this they're nodding you know and they people want to help others succeed they just forgot that you know um i don't know i we got to do something with this culture quick because we're going down the tube in a hand. Uh, it's not going good here for education right now. And it's just a microcosm of this country. You know? We will return to the Leaning into Leadership podcast in just a moment. But first, let me ask you a question. Have you ever said to yourself, man, I should write a book? Well, if you have, then let me ask you another question. What's holding you back? What keeps you from taking the step that moves you from, I have an idea about a book, to I am a published author. From experience, I would bet it's probably you're wondering who would even want to read a book that I wrote. Maybe you're questioning the idea. Is it unique enough? Is it valid enough? Is it good enough to be a book worthy of having published? Hey, as a best-selling author myself, I can tell you, most writers have had the exact same feelings at some point in time during their writing journey. Here at Road to Awesome, we believe in cultivating leaders by elevating voices and promoting positivity. And a part of that work is publishing books for educators by educators. Go to roadtoawesome.net and hit the Contact Us button to set up a free, no-obligation conversation about your book idea. Hey, educators, we've all had incredible experiences. We all have amazing stories. And every one of them deserves to be told. Go to roadtoawesome.net, hit the contact us button. Let's have that conversation about your book idea. And now, back to the Leaning into Leadership podcast. You know, we're faced with this incredible teacher shortage right now. And I know you shared with me here recently, you were, and I won't name the state, but you were, you were at a school that... Okay, state of Arizona. I used to teach there, so I guess I can say that. And that's where our buddy Eric is. But uh, and it wasn't Eric's school, by the way. But you said it was twenty-two out of twenty-five teachers were new, or yeah. Uh, well, well, there's a school in South Dakota that lost twenty out of twenty-five in a small rural school. They've replaced them, but what about that shortage? Then there's a school in Arizona where fifteen of their fifty teachers are not even education majors. There's a couple of them are student teachers. A couple are. I met one lady, she's a bank teller, and she's going to go teach like sixth grade. And it's like, what? I mean, so administrators listening, you know what I mean. It's, it's getting harder and harder to go drum up a math teacher in your community. So we got to rehabilitate and inspire the ones we got. We can't have people retiring at 58. We can't have a 26 year old say, I, I just don't want to continue this. We got to find a way to create a culture that retains people and, and fulfill. And there's two parts to this. One is you got to get them some money if you can, and bond issues. I know what you're dealing with. It, that's the one part is the you, you got to have a way to make a living at this. And some states, that's difficult. Uh, number two, there's got to be a good ride too, not just results, but ride. It's got to be a good ride at school. I got to enjoy going to work. I got to like my peers. I got to like the whole atmosphere of the school. 
But I think that's the two reasons teachers leave is they they don't like the ride or they don't like the results, which are, you know, salary and benefits and all that. I, I can't do anything about salary and benefits, but I think I can help you with the ride because we can create a better experience for people with working in this building. You know? Yeah. Well, it's um, like, you know, like our good buddy, uh, Phil Campbell says, you know, we want everyone wants to be seen and heard and loved. And that's just as important for our adults as it is for our kids. You know, when when our adults don't feel like they're valued, when they don't feel like they're part of something special, it's a lot easier to say, hey, I'm going to go try doing this. And maybe that means, you know, hey, I'm going to, you know, go teach in another school or I'm going to, you know, move back home to, you know, to where my family is or, or whatever the case may be. Or maybe it is, you know, hey, I'm going to go try a different profession. But um, I agree with you. I think it's really critical right now that our school leaders and our district leaders are doing everything they can to make sure that the the people that work in your buildings, not just in the classrooms, but in food service, in the custodial, uh, in your maintenance and operations, your bus drivers, your secretaries, on and on, your paraprofessionals, you know, the, the miracle workers that are your paraprofessionals, they've got to feel seen and heard and loved. They've got to know that they're valued and that they're part of something special. Um, I, I just think that's a that's a real critical piece. Um, I guess I guess what I what I would like to lead into now maybe is as you, as you look back, um, you know, maybe, maybe that's the first 47 years or, or the 23 cents. I mean, whatever the case may be, if there's a piece of advice, you could go back and tell, you know, 26 year old Tom Cody, you know, second or third year teacher, Tom Cody, what might that be? Uh, well, I had to have a lot to say to me. It's funny because a guy, a teacher in uh, North Carolina asked me that yesterday on the way out. We were walking out together. It's the exact same question. If you could go back in time. And I said a couple things. One, uh, you really want to put your self-esteem, Tom, 1.0, in the hands of a 16-year-old girl basketball player at the free throw line on a Friday night with a 1,000 people yelling at her. So if she fails, you're a failure. If she succeeds, you're a success. Don't you realize that that's a fool's game? She has no frontal cortex. You really want to put your self-esteem and your self-worth in the hands of a math student trying to finish a test on time. And then if they don't, you yell at them because you're a failure as a team. You're putting your eggs in that basket, young Tom, and that's not going to work for you. But at the time, it was just, it didn't even occur to me. You know, the other thing was, I would ask me, aren't you sick and tired of being sick and tired? You're not sleeping. You're overweight. Your alcohol consumption is not great. Like, look at your life. Your marriage is just okay. You're not a great dad. Now, I probably would have punched this guy talking to me at age 26. But going back, I would have no problem getting punched. <laughs> like, it's worth it. <laughs> like, aren't, you, aren't you tired of this? Like you, you, you pretend you're happy because you're getting high scores in the Hall of Fame for basketball. You, you pretend that that's okay. But come on, dude, dig down. You know it's not okay. I don't know. Now we're doing my damn therapy in front of the whole country here. <laughs> hey, you asked the question. You didn't know I was going to go there, did you? Yeah. Well, no, but that's, I, that's just how I answered it yesterday. It was, it was yeah. nasty to ask no. Yesterday. I like that. I did not. I, I did not know that that question had been asked of you yesterday. That that worked out really, oh, that weird. really well. That yeah, weird. no kidding. Yeah, it's all, it's like our brains are starting to sync up, which really is weird if that if that starts to happen. So, um, Tom, the last question I always ask every guest on the Leaning into Leadership podcast uh, is the question I'm going to ask you, which is right now, Tom, what are you doing to lean into leadership? Uh, well, travel 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 i'll go anywhere i i'm leaning into this idea uh teachers deserve administrators to be out ahead of them administrators deserve superintendents to be out ahead of them my task right now with my years of experience is to be out ahead of everybody i'm trying to come up with the next best idea i'm trying to come up with the next thing around positive culture i'm trying to come up with the next thing about how to hit learning targets and I've got a few answers. It's funny, Darren. You get old, you learn stuff, then you die. I, I figured out that's how this works. 
now I know where all the streets are in Minnesota, just in time to where I probably can't drive anymore. But what, the deal is, my job is to get out ahead of education. Plus, I'm flying at 60,000 feet here, people. I'm looking at education all over the country on Zoom, travel, North Carolina, fly to North Dakota. Heck, I go to Minot, North Dakota, so often I can vote there. So I'm seeing, <laughs> I'm seeing the big picture right now. That's my job as leadership is get to 60,000 because as superintendent, you're flying at about 8,000 because you got to deal with crap all day. Teachers are flying at eight feet off the ground. So can somebody get out in front of them and, and talk about these big issues? Talk about staying in your lane, talking about culture, talking about have we thought about, well, here are a couple things. You might have to have school on Saturdays eventually, people. You may have to change the work day. You might have to change how school looks. There's no teachers in the colleges. And I'm overstating that by just a tiny bit. We may have to rethink things. And somebody better be at 60,000 with me rethinking because it's not working at 8,000 feet altitude. We're going to have to radically shift how we see education in the next, I'd say, next decade. It's coming, people. And I don't know if you're going to put all the algebra kids in in Caspar, Wyoming, in a gymnasium all together with one teacher, like we used to do in college, I don't know what the answer is going to be. But somebody better be working on it, people. You know, it's like global warming. we got to figure out the icebergs here because they're coming to Miami soon. That was a metaphor. Yeah, no, it was a good metaphor. I like that. Yeah, that was that was really good. Um, so, so just just one final thing. So, Tom, uh, anybody who wants to get in contact with you, I'm going to put everything, of course, in the show notes. But uh, just real quick, how do my listeners get in touch with Tom Cody with Top Twenty Training and so forth? Here's a, I'll give it to you really easy. Everybody always gives you a website. Call me six five one nine eight three two six nine eight. I'm serious. Just text me, and we'll talk. If I don't answer, I died. Okay, like I'll I'll call you back. Uh, my Twitter is at Top Twenty Training. That's T O P two zero Training. We'll do something for you once a week, a one minute shot. If you, you know, if you just check it out on Top Twenty Training Twitter. Uh, you can get a hold of me at Tom. Uh, what's my email? Tom at Top Twenty Training dot com. But again, just call me. I'm serious. Or text me first because I don't know you're creeping me here. But six five <laughs> That's one, right. Six five one ninety three two six nine eight. Give me a call. I'll come to your district. Heck, if you're in Nome, Alaska, I'll go up there too. But I wouldn't wait three years. I'm seventy. One lady asked me about twenty twenty five the other day. I said, "You better have a handicap ramp." <laughs> I don't. Know. What do you mean twenty twenty five? That's wishful thinking. Oh, there you go. Just keep putting stuff on the calendar because I know you and I are going to continue to do stuff together. Um, and I know obviously you and, and the top 20 training crew will continue to do the great work that you're doing. So, Tom, thanks for joining me here on the Leaning Into Leadership podcast. Um, as always, my friend, it's great to have a conversation with you. And I'm glad that uh, the listeners got to, I guess, get a little behind the scenes or a peek behind the curtain at the goofy conversations we have once a week. Yeah. Hey, and before we go, Darren, keep up what you're doing. Uh, you're going to be driving the bus after I get off the bus. I mean, there's people, you're the next generation after us old people. And I'm just very impressed by the work ethic you're putting in on this, whether it's podcast books, uh, the scheduling things. You're on it now, man. And I really appreciate that about you. So keep up, keep up the revolution because the, the revolution's coming. Right on. Thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate you. And uh, we'll end the love fest right there. But uh, thanks so much for joining the podcast, Tom. See you later. As I said, I mean, that's just a peek behind the curtain for me. Um, every week, at least once or twice a week, I'm on a call or texting with Tom Cody. Um, again, Tom has become um, just such a great mentor to me and such a great friend. And uh, I really appreciate him coming on the show. I know you picked up a ton of great leadership insight from him. And, you know, really some awesome, awesome things related to school culture and climate. And, you know, shameless plug, um, like I said at the top of the show, Tom and I have been uh, going around the country speaking in schools, uh, speaking at conferences and that type of thing with our Stay in Your Lane uh, School Culture Starts With You program. 
um, reach out. Let's let's have a conversation. Bring Tom, bring me to your school. Let's lift your teachers up. Let's give them that opportunity to, uh, you know, kind of get reconnected with who they are and what really lights their fire. Um, I say it quite frequently, but you cannot be burned out if you've never been on fire. Kudos to my longtime mentor, Mike LaPiccolo, for that particular quote. The truth is you cannot be burned out if you've never been on fire. And every one of us who have stepped into education, and by the way, this is your pep talk for the week. Every one of us has stepped into education, stepped into education because something set us ablaze. There was something that made us absolutely light up with the passion and the energy and the fire that took us into the work we do in education. Now, over the last couple of years, there have been a lot of different things that can snuff out your fire without question. You know, and, and now we're, you know, we're a couple of months into your school year and all of that energy and all that excitement and maybe the great things you heard from a speaker at the, st- at the start of your school year or something like that has maybe kind of waned a little bit because now you're down in the weeds and you're focused on whatever content it is and you're struggling with some challenges with some kids and maybe you've you know had some issues in your community or, or any of those types of things. Folks, we just have to continue to remember what it is that sets us on fire. Remember what it is when it's time to fan the flames and to get it going again, that there was something that sets you on fire. Don't feel bad about burnout. Be willing to take care of yourself. Be willing to take that step, set some boundaries and say, hey, I got to walk away for a minute or I got to walk away for a day. Maybe I need to take a long weekend. I just need to catch my breath. That's okay. Fires need fuel. And if you're running on empty, it's hard for the fire to burn. Whatever it was that set you on fire, folks, that's what we cling to. That's how we work our way through that burnout. As the leaves begin to turn, as the temperatures begin to cool, as pumpkin spice everything begins to take over the shelves, the coffee shop, and even the beer aisle, don't forget to have yourself a Road to Awesome week Take a couple of deep breaths and remember, you've got this. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to the Leaning into Leadership podcast brought to you by Road to Awesome. Don't forget, click subscribe, give a review, and share this with somebody who might also enjoy leaning into leadership.